Okay, this afternoon we're going to shift gears a little bit and focus on geological issues. <clears throat> and in particular, we're going to focus, um, have a focus of, of the title given here, The Importance of the Genesis Flood to a Correct Understanding of the Earth's Past. And to me, this is a, an extremely important issue. Namely, where does the Genesis flood, the flood mentioned in Genesis chapters 6, 7, 8, 9, where, where does that event, what, how does that connect with the geological record, with, the, with the, the, the record of rock layers and volcanic events on the earth? So let me begin with this question, why is it? Why do most educated people today regard the flood merely as a naive myth instead of an actual part of earth history? The flood was regarded as genuine history throughout the Western world up to about 300 years ago. What has happened to change that? What, what was it took, that took place to change that state of affairs? Well, I'm going to suggest, as a short answer, it was the intellectual movement of the 1700s known as the Enlightenment. And I, I have in parentheses the atheist intellectual movement of the 1700s known as the Enlightenment. And uh, so if we go back into some of the Enlightenment movers and shakers, the, the, the leaders of the Enlightenment, and, and those that were concerned about earth history, a prominent individual comes into focus, namely James Hutton. And today he's regarded as the founder of modern geology, primarily for only, just a single reason. It, it's because he introduced the ideas of uniformitarianism and deep time in his book, Theory of the Earth in 1795. And a, a quote, a famous quote from that book is, no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. So it, and as he viewed earth history with uh, interpreting what has gone on in the past in terms of what is hap happening in the present, uh, as he looked at, into the rock record, he, he, he claimed he could see no, no vestige of a beginning. Uh, and, and because he, he was a uh, son of the Enlightenment, uh, because he did not believe that there was any, any agent outside of uh, the material realm that could intervene, he saw no prospect of an end. He saw the processes operating today continuing indefinitely into the future. So that, that reflected this uh, Hutton's outlook. Now, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, a person who died the year that Hutton, uh, who was born the, day, the, the year that Hutton died, is Charles Lyell, also from Scotland. And he's considered the father of modern geology. He's famous for his book, Principles of Geology, first published in 1830, but updated in 11 subsequent editions. And he was uh, zealous in his advocacy of uniformitarianism, summarized in the slogan, slogan the, the present is the key to the past. So he, he uh, had a profound impact on the whole field of of geology. Uh, students for several generations were trained in his book, Principles of Geology. So he had a, a, a profound uh, role in shaping what modern geology is, is all about. Now, a, a third person in this sequence is Charles Darwin. Uh, Charles uh, Darwin took a copy of Lyell's book first edition of, of Lyle's book on his trip around the world, five-year trip on the Beagle. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he saturated himself in that book during those five years. 
So the concepts that Lyell advanced in his book, Principles of Geology, were foundational to Darwin's speculations on how life might possibly have arisen with no action on God's part. So I, w I would say that Darwinian evolution is merely a logical extension of this uniformitarianism uh, uh, to the realm of biology. Uniformitarianism, I've, I've neglected to define here, but is basically the idea, as I'm, based on that quote in the previous slide, that the present is the key to the past. That the, a, a correct understanding of the past can be ob obtained by considering present-day processes operating at approximately present-day rates and extrapolating that picture indefinitely into the, into the past. Now, it's interesting that this state of affairs, that this outlook, uh, uh, this outlook was predicted uh, 2,000 years ago by the Apostle Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter says, Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Now here, uh, uh, the, the promise of his coming is referring to the promise of Jesus' return. And the reason these scoffers uh, uh, make fun of that idea, the reason they give, the justification they give they say, well, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. In other words, God has never intervened in a, in a physical way, in a major way, in the history of the earth since its creation. And so uh, what is Peter's response to that? He said, he, in the next verse, he says, For they are willfully ignorant of this fact, that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and that the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which water the earth at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. So here Peter is predicting that scoffers, and I, I, I am bold enough to say that is atheists, who reject the very concept of God, will also reject the claim that Jesus will return with the excuse that all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. In effect, they will be saying, because there have been no interventions by God in the past, what reason is there to expect any in the future? Peter counters this, this logic by pointing out two major interventions by God in the past, namely his creation of the heavens and the earth, and his, secondly, his later destruction by means of a flood of a world filled with violence and evil. Peter points out that these scoffers will willfully ignore these two major events in the actual history of the world. The view that all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation is known today as uniformitarianism. It is the proposition that the world's physical history can be correctly reconstructed by extending presently observed physical processes operating at approximately presently observed rates into the indefinite past. And more briefly, it is the claim that the present is the key to the past. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the widespread ex acceptance of this false vi version of history, of the history of the world, has decimated biblical Christianity in, in Europe over the last 200 years. And so, what, what exists today, I would, I would describe the scene as modern strongholds raised up against the knowledge of God. And what are some of these strongholds? Well, we talked about one of them in my first lecture, the stronghold of materialist philosophy, that there is no non-material reality. The only reality is that which is material. So that's one important aspect, one important legacy of the Enlightenment, materialist philosophy. Uh, another one which we talked about this morning is radioisotope dating methods that uh, reinforce this idea that uh, the Earth has this ex 
this past extending back millions and billions of years, essentially with modern processes operating at close to modern rates throughout that entire period. And then we have Darwinian evolution, which we have discussed. And then uh, what I'm going to focus on in this lecture is uniformitarian geology. Uh, again, reflecting this uh, uh, idea that the present is the key to the past. And one topic where I, have, I decided not to include is Big Bang cosmology. Basically, that the universe has created itself somehow, needs no creator. Okay. So, uh, so we, d despite the scoffing by the skeptics during the past 220 years, the Bible itself allows no room for uncertainty that a global world-destroying flood cataclysm truly has occurred. So let's, let's look at, at uh, selected, some selected verses out of chapters uh, 6 and 7. Uh, verse 11 in chapter 6, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. Then God said to Noah, verse 13, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Uh, verse 17, Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. And he was, the context indicates the air breathing, land dwelling, air breathing life will perish. Uh, chapter 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Later in chapter 7, the water prevailed more and more upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. Verse 21, all flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was, was the breath of the spirit of life died. Verse 23, thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. The water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So this, in my view, is uh, very clear very uh, carefully crafted language as to the universality of the flood as far as uh, the earth is concerned. And uh, so a, a, a question then arises, what sort of physical evidence would an event as described in Genesis 7 leave behind? Uh, would, would it not leave some evidence, physical evidence behind? I would say it would have to leave. It would have to leave abundant physical evidence behind. So what about billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth? Some of you may have heard that quote before. Uh, Ken Ham likes to use it. It's his quote. Uh, when, we, when we actually examine the rock record, what do we observe? What do, we, what do we see when we look into the rock record? Well, uh, I would suggest that, that uh, what we actually find are billions of dead things buried in sediment layers all over the earth. Uh, and, and in some cases, very dramatically, animals buried, buried alive, evidence that they were alive when they were buried, Bur in, in, buried in large numbers, buried under catastrophic conditions. And actually, in general, fossils require unusual conditions to be preserved. There needs to be rapid burial and complete burial for, for, the, for an animal or a plant, for that matter, to be preserved as a fossil. Uh, so we have, we have large animals, 
like this plesiosaur, uh, a, a swimming, large swimming reptile buried, uh, buried whole, buried alive. We have pterosaurs like these, uh, these specimens uh, depicted here from the Big Bend area of Texas uh, uh, in the fossil record. Very, some, some amazing animals. Uh, we, we have, uh, in some cases, uh, huge, huge herds of dinosaurs buried together. Uh, at this site at Dinos Dinosaur National Monument in Vernal, near Vernal, Utah, we have chunks of, of many dinosaurs all buried together. They're, they're, it's evident they're, they were buried under violent conditions uh, because within each chunk, the, the bones are still articulated, still joined together. Uh, but uh, it appears that the, uh, there was such violence that these large, large uh, animals were ripped apart and chunks of them buried all jumbled together. Again, I, I emphasize fossilization of an organism requires rapid and complete burial. Fossils are hence a reliable indicator of catastrophic conditions. The fact that fossils are so common throughout the Cambrian to Cenozoic sediment record argues that this entire record is a record of catastrophe on a global scale. Uh, and fossil plants as well testify to, to this kind of global cataclysm. Uh, we have examples of incredible quantities of plant debris buried together. An example is the Powder River Basin coal form formation in northern Wyoming and southern uh, Montana. Forty percent of all the coal used in the U.S. comes from this single deposit. And probably, I, I don't know the statistics, but probably a majority of the coal mined there is exported. So we have a uh, a, a, a coal seam in many places uh, on the order of 30 meters or 100 feet in thickness. And uh, it's evident from the, the nature of the coal that it did not, it's not a result of trees that grew in place, but is, have been transported in from some other location where they grew. So this is what's called an allochthonous formation. Uh, 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 um, plant material that grew somewhere else, transported in here and buried in this catastrophic manner. Uh, moreover, even apart from their fossils, the sediment layers themselves testify to conditions radically different from those operating in our world today. So most fossil-bearing rock layers are, some of these characteristics uh, is that they are horizontally extensive for hundreds to thousands of kilometers in both directions. Another feature is that the boundaries between the layers display little or no erosional channeling. In stark contrast to our world today, where the Earth's surface is, is deeply channeled by erosional processes. Yet as we look at the, at the sediment record, we see very little uh, internal channeling of, between these sediment layers. It appears that the conditions responsible for deposition of the sediment record were radically different from what's going on at the Earth's surface today. We do not, for, in general, see these dramatic examples like Bryce Canyon, Zion Canyon, Grand Canyon, uh, cut into these, into these layers. Uh, uh, that, that, we, that make up the majority of the Phanerozoic sediment record. Moreover, as I have already indicated, the, the um, boundaries between these layers uh, tend to be very sharp. And this is, this is a good example. This boundary between the Coconino sandstone and the Hermit Shale uh, shown here along the Bright Angel Trail in the Grand Canyon. That contact essentially is is a knife edge sharp, and so uh, the uh, you know there's very very little evidence for a, a great elapse of time. Very no uh, uh, no erosion, no sediment 
no soil formation. It, it's just as if the, uh, uh, the Coconino sandstone was a, a, a deposited abruptly on top of this shale layer. You, you even see cross beds. You can, if you know, I'll, I'll describe what those are in a moment, coming down and intersecting this boundary abruptly. So, uh, cross beds in the Coconino sandstone. So, uh, uh, so this is uh, where that, that contact exists in this, uh, this uh, cross section I showed earlier. It's between this, bright, this light-colored layer, the Coconino sandstone, the underlying hermit shale. And I would, I would say that this, this kind of flat contact is a, a characteristic of the boundaries but, uh, between a majority of these sediment layers. Uh, however, the, there's a lot of internal, the internal structures of many of the layers imp, imply catastrophic processes uh, were responsible for their formation. Uh, what we see here are the cross beds in the Navajo sandstone. This area pictured here is the, the so-called the, the wave area near the Utah-Arizona border. And so the, the, uh, the uh, undulations you see correspond to the, the dune type of structure in, within the Navajo sandstone, characteristic of the entire uh, Navajo sandstone layer across uh, uh, several, several, more than close to 200,000 square miles of it, of that formation. The speed, the size and speed of the water currents needed to generate such huge dune structures is challenging for our minds to imagine. Um, so this Navajo sandstone dis displays giant cross beds as, as well as vast lateral extent. Strong indicators, both strong indicators of high water, of high energy water transport. Here we have uh, 2,000 high, more than close to 2,500 uh, feet high cliffs at Zion National Park. And they re re represent the exposed edge of a gigantic sheet of sand, the Navajo sandstone, that stretched originally from Southern California to Central Wyoming and from Idaho to New Mexico. Its volume is sufficient to bury the entire state of Texas to a depth of 87 meters. So that's uh, like 200 and 280 feet. So can the, can the rock record... What can the rock record tell us about the beginning of this, uh, this era or this episode of cataclysm that's responsible for this, these unique features of the sedimentary record? Just where might we look to find the beginning point in this record? Well, if buried plants and animals reliably identify the sediment layers deposited during the flood, then the sudden first appearance of a wide diversity of animals likely marks the flood's beginning point. Do we find such a location in the record? Yes, we do. The abrupt appearance of an astonishing diversity of complex animals lies just above a striking erosional discontinuity <coughs> of global extent known as the Great Unconformity. The term Cambrian explosion is often applied to this part of the record. 23 of the 27 animal phyla in the entire fossil record uh, exist in these Cambrian rocks. Uh, and, uh, and the erosional aspects of this, this great unconformity uh, tell us, reveal, that the flood's onset was exceedingly violent. This is, uh, this is a one location where the great unconformity is nicely exposed in central Wisconsin. And here we have giant uh, uh, boulders made of baraboo quartzite atop the, uh, on top of the massive baraboo formation. So these huge boulders, I have my hand against one of them, lie directly on top of this uh, uh, contact with the massive uh, baraboo quartzite beneath. So we have uh, some kind of, and this is another photo at that boundary, 
the great unconformity, indicating that some process was able to rip up the top portion of the Baraboo Quartzite, transport it, and deposit it as large boulders uh, just above this contact. Now, this is, uh, this is evident in many places. We have almost the identical situation in the Grand Canyon with quartzite that looks remarkably similar to the Baraboo Quartzite, has a purplish color. Uh, so in the, in, the, in the Grand Canyon, this boundary between the over, with overlying horizontal layers and underlying layers, in some cases at, at a pretty sharp angle, are, are even uh, uh, igneous basement rocks beneath. This is, this is the great unconformity. And uh, it's uh, well, uh, well exposed in the Grand Canyon. It's at the base of the layer known as the Tapete Sandstone. I've marked the base of that layer in, with these green arrows. And the, the uh, Tapete Sandstone is that cliff-forming layer just above that boundary with the Bright Angel Shale just above. It, Bright Angel Shale is soft relative to the underlying Tapete Sandstone, so it, it forms a more gentle slope. Uh, Above, so it's once you start to uh, recognize these layers in the canyon, it's possible to uh, stand on the rim, uh, in this case the south rim, and see this this uh, this Tapete sandstone layer and the underlying great unconformity from one horizon to the other. It's that uh, well exposed. Now this is. Uh, the actual contact at that boundary uh, with the, uh, in this case, the Hakatai Shale just beneath the boundary and the Tapete Sandstone just above. And note the size of the cobbles in that Tapete Sandstone, in the base of that Tapete Sandstone. Not quite as big as those in, in Wisconsin, but nevertheless large class and also a quartzite, a purplish quartzite. Uh, now, there are some large clasts right at the boundary, and this is one of them. This is one that's about more than 15 feet in diameter, weighs 20 tons, a big chunk of, uh, in this case, Shinumu quartzite, just above, right on top of that boundary uh, in the Grand Canyon. And you can see some other pretty large chunks of rock right around it. So we see evidence of catastrophic, uh, catastrophically violent processes able to dislodge boulders of this size and move them around, probably as part of large debris flows. Uh, okay, now what about the end of the cataclysm? If, that, if, that's, if that's what the beginning of this, of this record of the cataclysm looks like, what about the end? After so vast amount of sediment had been carried onto the continents and deposited in horizontally, horizontally extensive layers, a significant fraction of that sediment was subsequently stripped away from the continent interiors and carried by runoff water to the continental shelves at the end of the flood. So one thing that marks the end of the cataclysm is a stripping away of huge amounts of sediment by the runoff. And that's also evident in this cross-section that I've been showing, that uh, subsequent to the deposition of all these layers, huge volumes of that sediment were removed uh, by erosion after that entire sequence was already deposited. And so thus we see what is known as the grand staircase with uh, 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 Depths of it eroded away, increasing in depth as you go south, leaving this step-like uh, uh, structure behind with the uh, steps occurring at the, with the more resistant layers. And so, uh, so we uh, have huge amounts, shown by these horizontal black arrows, huge amounts of sediment that were stripped away. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we see some erosional remnants. For example, the the Monument Valley monuments represent 
the remnants that remained after this rapid stripping away of sediment. In summary, a staggering amount of geological change took place during this global cataclysm. The Bible reveals that it all unfolded within the span of only a single year. So what is the correct interpretation of the fossil record? Is it the record of some 580 million years of evolution? Or is it tangible documentation of the destruction of life by the flood during a single year? Which is it? Well, uh, I'll say some of you are surely thinking, but I've been taught all my life that the fossil record spans hundreds of millions of years. What about the radioisotope methods that consistently yield such vast ages for the Earth's rocks and for these very sedimentary rocks? Uh, Well, this indeed is a critical issue, crucial issue. Uh, And it was addressed as I... Talk, spoke on this morning by the, the uh, RAID initiative, Radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth. And this research documented multiple lines of radioisotope evidence which limit the Earth's age to about 6,000 years. Um, we also have evidence for a, a shorter history of, of uh, geologic time, shorter geologic history by looking at uh, 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 soft tissue preservation, well-preserved flexible blood vessels, for example, containing red blood cells in dinosaur bone. So the key issue with regard to the flood is that if the Bible is true concerning the reality of the flood, physically, how could so much change occur in the span of only a single year? What conceivably could have been the main causal mechanism? So at this point, I have given just a a brief overview of some evidences that the the rock record is indicative of catastrophic processes, that that record is not, does not um, affirm the idea of uh, that that the present is the key to the past. We do not see the present present type of of erosion and sedimentation, namely local erosion uh, and local sedimentation. We see it producing small-scale formations. We see a a radically different picture of of, uh, very large-scale sedimentary deposits uh, and even even very large-scale volcanic deposits, much larger than are forming today in the the rock record. So... uh, so I'm going to transition now and look at, at uh, the mechanisms that were responsible, could be responsible, had to, logically had to be involved uh, to allow such change to unf- unfold very quickly. So we're going to look at some of the main causal mechanisms. So uh, we're going to begin uh, with clues from, from the ocean bottom as to what some of the main causal mechanisms must have been. Now, a huge discovery of the 1960s was that all of today's oceanic crust is younger than much of the fossil-bearing sediment record on the continents. So we've, we've been looking at that fossil record, sediment record. Uh, and uh, like I said, like I'm saying here, a major discovery was essentially all of today's ocean crust has formed since a large portion of that fossil record was already deposited on the continents. So all the ocean crust on the earth today has formed since the point marked with the, the, uh, that blue arrow. So everything above the Kaibab limestone, which, which you find at the rim of the Grand Canyon, everything higher in the record than that has formed since the, on, uh, well, all, all the ocean floor has formed since that point in the continent sediment record. This means that all of today's basaltic ocean crust has formed since the onset of the flood, if the flood corresponds to uh, layers containing fossils. 
This implies that the opening of the entire Atlantic Ocean occurred during the flood, and also that the continents migrated by thousands of miles in only a few months' time. Uh, what about the pre-flood ocean floor? Well, it is missing uh, from the Earth's surface today, except for a few tiny remnants known as ophiolites, uh, uh, little fragments that have been thrust into the continental uh, uh, sediment sequence. We have a few, few little pieces of that, but otherwise, all, everything that's in the ocean today, the ocean bottom, is, uh, has none of that, what would be the pre-flood ocean floor. Uh, so taking cues from today's seafloor, all that pre-flood ocean floor must have been recycled into the Earth's interior during the flood. The conclusion that rapid, large-scale tectonic change must have been a fundamental aspect of the Genesis flood has come to be known as catastrophic plate tectonics. And this uh, concept was first presented uh, in the... Uh, creation community in 1986 at the first international conference on creationism in Pittsburgh. Such large-scale tectonic change at the Earth's surface implies that the Earth's interior was also involved uh, in the flood in a profound way. Let's review, let's, let's first look at some of the basics of the Earth's internal structure. This is a cross-section of the Earth it shows uh, the two main parts of the Earth's interior, which are the core, the dark blue part, which is mostly molten iron, and the, and the mantle, which is the lighter blue, or the medium blue here, which is mostly solid silicate rock. The uppermost part of the mantle is the thin, cold, mechanically rigid lithosphere, which is white in color. Uh, which is broken into about a, a dozen large plates. And just below the lithosphere is the much weaker asthenosphere. And it's uh, on average a, a, about at least a, a thousand times weaker than the lith lithosphere. So it uh, allows the lithosphere to slide smoothly, smoothly, almost with no resistance whatever, over the rest of the mantle. So, uh, one aspect of, of uh, plate tectonics, a major aspect is that in, in, uh, cer along certain uh, narrow zones, the ocean, ocean lithosphere is plunging into the Earth's interior. And uh, some very, there's some very special uh, consequences that occur at the, in these subduction zones. One, uh, most of the time, the over, overriding plate is stuck, mechanically stuck to the subducting plate. So it is, when it's stuck, it's being pulled down progressively by the sinking plate. But when it slips, ep episodically, every so often, the, it slip occurs. The, the plates become unstuck, and there's an earthquake. And, and so... The, uh, the overriding plate returns to its unstressed position. And, uh, and during these episodes of slip, as I said, there are earthquakes uh, are, are, uh, occur. Another thing that, that takes place is that there is water carried down on the top of the subducting plate. And it, when, it, when the plate gets down to on the order of 60, 70 miles, that water... Uh, uh, comes out, is, is, is released from the plate, rises, and that water lowers the melting temperature of, of the rocket is in and allows partial melting of that overlying material. So we have uh, uh, commonly a, a ring of volcanoes, a, a line of volcanoes that's inboard from the, where the subduction is occurring. And in the Pacific this, uh, this line of volcanoes is known as the Ring of Fire. So we have earthquakes and volcanoes commonly associated with this subduction process today. Uh, now, where plates are pulling apart, often in the middle of the ocean basins, uh, there's a, a, a process known as seafloor spreading. 
that takes place. And uh, new seafloor is produced as, as magma, uh, uh, small amounts of, of molten rock rise to fill the gap as these plates are pulling apart. And uh, in general, this molten rock has basaltic composition and re results in a layer of basaltic ocean crust about six to seven, five to seven kilometers in thickness. And also associated with these, this seafloor spreading is extremely high heat flow right there where the plates are pulling apart. Okay, so that's what's happening today. Now, catastrophic plate tectonics is similar to conventional plate tectonics that we observe occurring today, except the plate velocities are about a billion times higher, uh, on the order of five miles per hour instead of about two inches per year. So how is this conceivably possible? Well, laboratory experiments show that mantle rock weakens dramatically under stress. It, and, and, and at stress levels that can exist in the Earth, in a planet the size of the Earth with a gravity field uh, uh, equal to that of the Earth. And this weakening uh, due, to, due to stress provides the potential for a runaway catastrophe, uh, which I'll get to in a little bit later. First, let's look at how much continental motion uh, logically has to have occurred during the flood. The following images summarize how the continents have moved just since the time when the supercontinent Pangaea existed, as reconstructed by secular Earth the Earth secular Earth science community. These, were, these images are, were produced by Professor Ron Blakey of Northern uh, Arizona University and can be found online. So here we have... Uh, Pangaea uh, represented in the early Triassic, and then we have some uh, snapshots in time uh, uh, to, to get to the present as to what unfolded since that point in geologic history. So I'll run this little, little uh, movie backwards uh, and forwards again. So we're talking about considerable uh, continent movement during the flood. If all this, if the fossil record that we have represents a record of the flood, that, that logically requires this sort of continental motion and that, and, and that amount of new seafloor being produced. Uh, Again, summarizing what I just said, because fossils are indicative of the, of the geological record associated with the flood, all the plate motion shown in the preceding sequence, sequence must have accompanied the flood and unfolded in a span of a few months' time. So, so, catastro so catastrophic plate tectonics, like conventional te plate tectonics, accounts for many of the Earth's physical features, including the mid-ocean ridges, the deep ocean trenches, the global distribution of earthquakes, volcanism adjacent to trenches. Uh, so again, it, it accounts for uh, the, uh, the seafloor spreading, new ocean crust forms at mid-ocean ridge where plates are moving apart, associated with high heat flow. Uh, it, uh, account, it, it involves subduction uh, and uh, accounts for the earthquakes and volcanism we have today. Uh, this is a location of earthquakes, the, the yellow dots with magnitudes greater than 4.5 that occurred between 1980 and 1995. You can note that the earthquakes are concentrated along plate boundaries, those blue-green lines. So uh, catastrophic plate tectonics accounts for this. Th these, these, uh, this motion is a res residual motion from, from that bigger catastrophe that occurred not that long ago. Also, the, we, this is a map of the world's active volcanoes. Most of them you see here are along these subduction zones, around the so-called ring of fire around the Pacific. But there are some geological processes that are distinctive to catastrophic plate tectonics and not observed today uh, with our, our present plate tectonic regime. 
So some of these, some of these features I'll, I'll list here are supersonic steam jets emerging from the seafloor along 60,000 kilometers or 40,000 miles of rapidly spreading mid-ocean rift zones. So one, one feature that we would expect in this catastrophic regime are these supersonic steam jets. Another consequence, another feature would be intense global rain from the entrained ocean water lofted above the earth by the steam jets. So here, uh, this is an attempt to illustrate that, that where these plates are moving apart so rapidly, you have uh, molten rock in direct contact with seawater producing supercritical water, which very quickly flashes to steam and produces uh, these incredible steam jets that come blasting up from the sea bottom and, and entraining significant amounts of seawater with them. And as that liquid water falls back to the earth, it represents torrential rain. In addition, other effects are giant tsunamis as rapidly subducting ocean plates temporarily stick and then release via large earthquakes. Another, another uh, consequence is uh, significant up and down motions of the earth's surface because of rapid flow of rock inside the earth. Another is a dr dramatic uplift of today's mountain belts at the end of the cataclysm as uh, as the uh, earth comes back into isostatic equilibrium at the end of the cataclysm. And an, a final uh, consequence is an ice age following the flood because of the increased temperature of the ocean, of the ocean water, uh, a, lot, a lot of evaporation, much more than is occurring today, would occur, would occur in, the, in the century or so following the flood and result in very high precipitation rates in the high la high la at the high latitudes. So let's, let's uh, consider this issue of the tsunamis. In today's world, we, uh, we have uh, the, uh, uh, we have, starting in the lower left, we have uh, the plates stuck together along that dark black line. And we have the, the overriding plate dragged down by the sinking plate below. And so there's, the stress builds up as, as, the, as, the, uh, as the deformation increases, the stress builds up, and then uh, uh, all of a sudden the, uh, the plates unlock, uh, as you see in the lower right slide, and, uh, and, and the, uh, that overriding plate returns to its original position and you have the sea bottom pushed up and a huge wave uh, uh, launched, which uh, in, the, in the deep ocean travels at about 500 miles an hour and produces, typically produces catastrophic consequences when that wave uh, gets into shallow water and comes on land. So, uh, so we, that's one of the consequences. We, another is the uplift of the modern mountains, uh, generally, in many cases, adjacent to large subduction zones that existed during the flood. In the case of the Andes, we, we find that the crustal rock was thickened significantly uh, adjacent to the subduction zone, and at the end of the, end of the cataclysm, when the plate velocities plummeted, uh, those driving forces disappeared, and the Andes uh, rose, to, uh, according to what would be equivalent to Archimedes' principle, to, to isostatic equilibrium, and, and rose to their present heights very quickly after the flood. Now, I might mention, this is a big problem for conventional geology, the rapid recent lip uplifts of all the major mountain belts in the world, typically in, in the Pliocene and Pleistocene. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the, the warming of the oceans during the flood led to high rates of evaporation, precipitation, and rapid buildup of, of polar ice sheets and mountain glaciers in the centuries following the flood. So, uh, uh, so that gives a, that's, that, has to, that, that uh, 
relates to one of the big consequences of, of a, a, a cataclysm of this sort and, a, and a, what appears to be a major driving mechanism. But a crucial issue here is how can ocean plate uh, actually sink vertically through 2,900 kilometers of mantle rock or 2,000 miles of mantle rock in a few weeks' time? What f physical process could allow that to happen? Well, uh, first of all, the ocean plates can slide into the mantle they, they, and sink, and they do so today because they're cooler and denser than the mantle rock beneath. Uh, rapid plate motion can occur because mantle rock weakens under stress dramatically. So we're talking about instead of a few centimeters per year sinking velocities, we're talking about sinking velocities on the order of a few meters per second. So uh, for, for close to 50 years now, 40 to 50 years, uh, earth scientists have been measuring the deformational properties of the, of the minerals that make up the mantle. And this is an apparatus used uh, several decades ago. It actually is in a lab in Paris where stress is being applied to a sample in the middle of this oven. The oven controls the temperature of the sam sample very precisely. And the silica rods on each end are applying stress, actually shortening the sample at a certain rate, applying stress to that sample. And, and, and then when the experiment's over, the sample is examined under electron microscope. And the actual ways that the sample has deformed under that stress can be observed. You see uh, planes of atoms sliding over one another, just like a deck of cards being, being deformed, being sheared. Uh, so so these, uh, these deformation processes have been well studied over the last several decades. They've been studied well enough to produce uh, what are called stress-strain maps of, uh, for, for the various minerals. This is one from a publication in 1983 already, measured, experimentally measured deformation rates for the mineral olivine uh, as temperature and stress are varied. And I, I don't want to go into detail here, but uh, basically the, uh, the curves in the upper right portion of this of this diagram, the curves labeled power law creep, uh, those are actually measured rates in the laboratory, and those are the rates that would be implied by a ca catastrophe like we've just been talking about, on the order of 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 per second. So it's possible to measure rates like that, verify that they occur, and understand the conditions under which they occur. And you can see uh, one thing that's it's clear from, these, uh, from this plot, that you can have uh, the strength of these minerals change by a factor of one billion for relatively minor, relatively modest changes in the shear stress. So that this, uh, these deformational properties are, are uh, something that have been experimentally determined. So it's, po it's, it's possible then to take these experimentally determined properties, deformation properties of mantle minerals, and put them in a, a com use them in a computer calculation. And uh, I've done that, and uh, this is the result of a, a 2D calculation. Here, a color denotes temperature, blue is cold, uh, orange is, is warm, and uh, uh, I, 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 uh, to get the calculation going, I put a blob, a cold blob at the top, a hot blob at the bottom, and it takes very little time for those blobs to run away. I've put the actual deformation laws obtained experimentally into this calculation, and you get a very spectacular runaway. Those are a few uh, snapshots from the uh, following... Um, animation. I might mention here that the energy driving these, this flow is simply the gravitational potential energy associated with the initial temperature differences. 
the hot material or cold material at the top, hot dense material wants to sink. The, the hot uh, buoyant material at the bottom wants to wants to rise. So this uh, this shows uh, doing careful um, calculations. You you readily get velocities on the order of a few meters per second, and allow and that allows these this overturn, this mantle overturn, to occur in uh, a few weeks' time with these kind of velocities. So this, uh, this is something that, that uh, this, this potential for a runaway catastrophe is something that is, is, can be um, verified uh, through these kind of numerical calculations. This 2D simulation, although it may not seem that complex or impressive, demonstrates that the physics indeed works, specifically that stress, stress weakening in rocks can produce catastrophic consequences in a planet with the gravity field of the Earth. So um, I did my PhD thesis at UCLA uh, to develop a 3D model for the mantle and did that work, actually did the research work here at Los Alamos. And uh, it resulted in the first 3D uh, computer model for the mantle. And this is a cutaway view of the grid that I used. This particular one is moderately coarse, f somewhat crude compared to ones I've done since. But this, this particular grid has 32 ra radial layers of cells and uh, a total of 1.35 million cells. So the, ma ma the mantle is chopped up into these small little cells, and then the equations uh, represent, re representing conservation of energy, conservation of mass, conservation of momentum are solved simultaneously on a, on a, on a computer, and one can therefore model the flow of material inside a planetary mantle. So I'm going to show a little calculation I've done, starting with a distribution, a continent distribution uh, similar to this uh, reconstruction of Pangaea. And um, this is the, the reconstruction that this calculation used, showing the present-day continents outlined in, in these dark black lines uh, and uh, with, with uh, cold material uh, extending down only 400 kilometers uh, with a, 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 dense, a higher density, slightly higher density, corresponding to a temperature 400 degrees centigrade colder, just to get the calculation going, just to provide a little nudge initially to get the calculation going. And with this re relatively simple initial condition, we get a motion that unfolds that causes this this uh, configuration of continents to break apart and move roughly in the direction that they have moved since Pangaea existed. So this is a cross-section of the initial condition. Uh, assume uniform temperature in the, in the interior, except for these little, little cold uh, excursions due to the little, little bit of, of cold material introduced at the top. And, and, and so when we uh, let that calculation run, just solving these, these conservation equations, we see the continent blocks moving apart roughly in the right directions. So it's, this is just suggest, a suggest, suggestive of the kind of motions that can unfold. And, and so this, that's, that's, this shows the cross-section of that coal material at the subduction zone falling to the bottom uh, roughly at, at meters per second velocities and hot material that had been along the boundary rising in a, in a fashion that, that causes mid-ocean ridges to form. So this is a view of that calculation from the North Pole showing that continent movement. This is a view from the South Pole showing that same from that same calculation, showing that kind of mo motion. Uh, I don't want to make too much of this, other than the fact that, that uh, num it's possible to, to model these kinds of processes today numerically. Uh, and this, is, this calculation shows sea level, 
with the purple line denoting uh, the, the, where sea level is. Basically, it shows that the continents get flooded in this, during this process. So, uh, so let me, um, my hour, I'm going to close. We're going to take a break in a moment, but I, I want to uh, address this following question. Is there evidence supporting a recent episode of catastrophic plate tectonics? And I would say yes. Seismic images of the mantle, of today's mantle, reveal a ring of unexpectedly cold rock at the bottom of the mantle, beneath the subduction zones that surround the Pacific Ocean. Now, this is a uh, this is a uh, a uh, a view. Two actually two views. One from the western hemisphere and one of the eastern hemisphere. And the uh, what we see. The, the blue denotes coal material down at the Coromandel boundary. And uh, basically we see a ring around what is today the, the, the perimeter of the Pacific Ocean. And, and the same ring you see when viewed from the Eastern Hemisphere. And in the center on both hemispheres, on, on the, in the Western Hemisphere, you see a blob of, of red, of, of hot material, that appears to have been squeezed together like toothpaste by this sinking region of coal material uh, that rises is, is called a, uh, this is the Pacific super swell or, or, or a, a super plume. And we see an, an, an analogous feature uh, beneath Africa, especially West Africa and South Africa, that's, that's, that also comes up from the, uh, the core mantle boundary, uh, well up into the mantle. So I would, and, and the problem of this, with this, that has been a challenge for earth scientists for more than 20 years, almost, well, a good 25 years, is, uh, is the, the, the magnitude of the density difference that's implied uh, by the, the seismic data. Uh, it, if, this, if this density difference is a result of temperature, temper, temperature differences, it implies a temperature difference of about 3,000 degrees centigrade between the blue and the red. And uh, it's, uh, uh, in, in, in the uniformitarian framework, it's unthinkable that these cold slabs that have subducted could retain these cold temperatures for on the order of 100 million years. The fact that the, these, uh, this cold material basically reflects the temperature of surface lithosphere today, uh, if it is a temperature difference, implies that that material must have gone down very recently. Must, be a, 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 must have been a very recent event that emplaced that cold material around the, on, on top of the core mantle boundary. Of course, uh, that is that, that's unacceptable in the standard um, community, and so there's been all kinds of gyrations, all kinds of ideas proposed to escape that conclusion. Generally, the the main idea is that it must represent chemical heterogeneity. This must be a chemical signal, chemical differences rather than temperature differences, uh, account to account for this density difference. But I say the most straightforward interpretation is a temperature difference. And uh, so it, 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 to me, it is a, a pretty powerful indicator, pretty fair, a powerful indicator, a confirmation of a recent episode of catastrophic plate tectonics. Okay, so again, what we, what we would have is this coal material represents the, the material subducted during this catastrophic episode that resurfaced the earth and, uh, and the hot material would be the stuff that has risen up from the core mantle boundary. And the, again, the energy driving this process is simply the gravitational potential energy associated uh, with the initial mantle temperature differences. Okay, some remaining issues. How were the continents flooded and by what means was the huge volume of sediment with its fossil, fossils transported and deposited. So we're going to take up that topic after the break. 
So uh, let's take a break now, and um, uh, I will be available to answer questions uh, after at least I get a drink of water. Uh, let, why don't we take uh, a, a, like five minutes for a few quick questions, and then I'll expect I'll have I think after the next talk we'll have an extended period for Q and A. Okay. Let's get a drink of water first. But, <laughs> um, so I guess I'll only bring up a couple of these. So I have a few issues with your sedimentation model um, attributing everything to the flood. Uh, so you're saying that all of the layers of sedimentary rock on Earth essentially were deposited by this one flood and also eroded by the same flood. Um, so where does lithification come into that? Like how did these sediments become rocks at the surface of the Earth without uh, burial and compaction and cementation? Well, as, as they're deposited, you've got, you've got, cons you've got immediate compaction you, you expel you expel the, the the water that's that's originally present in these sediments when they're deposited. So you have rapid uh, escape pipes. You have r rapid dewatering of the sediments and compaction. And with uh, with enough uh, cementing agents, that cementation process can go quickly. And I mean, you you uh, concrete cures in a few hours. So it's it's uh, so you can cement sediment together quickly under right conditions. I'm not saying it's not a challenge, but I'm saying that uh, you 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 expel the water quickly, and you have a, you have the cementation agents present. You can get relatively quick uh, lithification. Um, so I guess this is an answer to that. Uh, why why wouldn't you have uniform cement composition? For instance, uh, there are sandstones cemented by silica. There are carbonate cement sandstones. You have some with iron rims. Um, you have some with iron rims that have been reduced and carried away. Right, right. So I'm, I'm saying it depends on, on the, uh, you know, you have water. As this dewatering takes place, you can exchange. You're going to have, you can have the original water replaced from water from below. You can have, have, have the cementing agents come from in that water that's coming up. Uh, and uh, so it's, uh, it's not simple, but it's, it's not unthinkable that you can have, you know, different cementing agents in different, in different environments. That is true, but there are also sharp contacts between different chemical compositions of cement, um, which if this was all one event, there would be mixing, there would be turbidity yeah. between those, so you want to get a uniform cement composition. Right. Well, there, there, there is a, in, in very frequently, and you have a, a dramatic differences in, in uh, lithology, in chemical composition of the layers. So uh, you, uh, it's not surprising that you can have sharp contacts with these abrupt changes in the base, basic lithology. So I, I, I don't have good answers. We would need to, on, on, we'd, we'd need to look at this as a, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. But uh, basically, I would be looking for uh, mechanisms that work quickly. And, and uh, I, I can point to evidences of very rapid dewatering and uh, uh, evidences of relatively quick cementation. So whether those work all can explain everything, uh, I don't know. But I would I would say the the case for the overall case for um, conditions that are radically different from today, in my opinion, is strong. So you you, you need to sort of uh, adjust your habit as a geologist from looking at the micro scale to be to be look at the big, try to look at the big picture. So, uh, uh, you know, that's one of the big uh, conflicts between geophysicists and geologists. The geophysicists often are, it's easier for them to see the big picture, consider the big picture. It, it's often a challenge for geologists to look beyond their hand samples and the immediate field context. So I, I think both, both are important. 
but one needs, you can't do one to the exclusion of the other. You need to, you need to look at the bigger picture. Which, which is true. So that also leads into the fact that these units aren't laterally homogenous. Um, so basically, for instance, the Hermit Shale that you showed there, in the Grand Canyon, it's a shale. Um, in my field area in northern Arizona, it was a medium grain sandstone. And it's a gradational change the whole way. Yeah, right. Um, the, the, the Hermit Shale, that's certainly true, has well, huge amounts of heterogeneity. Yes. So these laterally, what you described as very laterally continuous units, yes, they're laterally continuous, but they're not laterally homogenous. That's and right. so that doesn't have to be a cataclysmic event for them to in but fact, it, it, argue it, it, again them, you, you know, all, if you're talking about the, the the continent interior we do not see formations like that being produced in the present uh, such, with such lateral continuity which is true because the vast majority of depositional environments are at sea um, which is why also you want to see erosional features in many of these units because those are erosional environments yeah. whereas say so you we're go talking to the, we're, we're the basically talking Delta, yeah then we're, you have a depositional environment right. where you get like cliniforms and uh, a progradation to near shore sediments and then offshore sediments which you can see in the rock record with a laterally continuous that, that is, that's that's right but so you you have I, the processes today that we can directly observe that do explain these the the lateral um in homogenous yeah. layers. So I'm saying that we're talking about, I mean, the word that, we're, that I'm using is flood, which generally uh, implies things are underwater. So we have the continent interiors uh, flooded to a much larger degree for most of the record than we observe today in today's world. With such high energies, energies it would also imply that there would be almost chaotic deposits like you you would you would expect many boulders and cobbles and mixed with fine grained sediments throughout yeah. most of it so my, my rather next, than yeah, my sequence next, stratigraphy where you have cycles that yeah, the, my, my next talk is, is, is at least a beginning effort to deal with the sedimentary processes okay so I'll, that's the focus of my next talk uh okay just a quick question about if, uh, if everything sediments and get, gets hard real fast, how did you get the Grand Canyon? How did you erode the Grand Canyon if everything got really hard real fast? Well, you need, the, you need most of the sediments exposed in the Grand Canyon already lithified before the canyon gets cut. How can that happen? It's not getting cut now. Well, basically, our, 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 uh, our model is that there was a, a lot of there was a, there were large interior lakes that uh, uh, catastrophic, catastrophically emptied through what is now the, the the Grand Canyon and cut the canyon in a very brief period in a catastrophic way, emptying a, a large large interior lake that uh, roughly covered the Four Corners area and and much of the area north up uh, along, around the Green River. Uh, so uh, have a huge volume of water cutting the, uh, what amounted to a, a, a dam just west of the Grand Canyon and, and cut down through that, that uh, monocline uh, rather quick, very quickly. Eroded the canyon, cut the canyon quickly, leaving, sweeping out the, uh, the sediment, uh, being so violent that it carried all of that debris far downstream most of it down to San Diego County. So to be cynical, anytime you need a mechanism to do something, you can manufacture it. Okay. Hey, we need a lake. Okay, there was a lake. Okay, well we look at the we okay, we look that we'll just talk about the uh, the the sediment eroded from the canyon. If it was eroded sl slowly, it should be fairly close by. We do not find the, that volume of sediment that is implied by the cutting of the canyon, we do not find it just west of the canyon. We find it down in the Anza Borrego Desert and in the in the in the uh, Gulf of California. And it well, it doesn't follow for me that it should be close by. The Colorado River is carrying it. 
Well, in general, no reason for the Colorado River to deposit it. Well, and we, as a matter of fact, there are lots of depositions in the Lake Mead area, which is how they explained how the, how the Grand Canyon got formed. Well, we can talk about this more later, but I would say that you do not find in the Lake Mead area anywhere near the amount of sediment that's, that's needed. That's called a river delta, John. Well, the river delta is down in, in uh, several hundred miles away. The, the, the delta that that, that, that 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 erosion produced. Okay, let's take a break. Uh, roughly maybe 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, we'll, we'll resume.